Welcome back to All the Shit, the podcast that continues the conversation that started with the book, All the Shit I Wish I Knew in High School, which is available to stream for free as an audiobook at thathighschoolbook.com. All right, I'm sorry for the spotty release schedule to start the year. It's been a rough couple weeks for me. Traveling for work, catching COVID for the third time, all of which have been on business trips, by the way, and then spending this last week recovering. Sorry if my voice sounds like crap, but I'm working on getting back to normal. My goal is to continue publishing new content weekly, but sometimes it can be a tough task with a one-man production crew. The overall goal of this project is to tackle the tough questions young people have about growing up and offer some guidance and perspective that will hopefully help develop new ways of looking at perceived problems and provide some tools to start creating their own solutions. While this podcast is aimed primarily at young adults, I hope this conversation will help broaden your perspective, regardless of age. This week's episode features the second half of my conversation with Elvire, a friend of mine who came to the United States in the early 90s as a refugee from the war in his native country of Bosnia. If you missed the first episode, I highly recommend going back and listening to it before jumping into this one. In that episode, Elvir recounted his family's escape from the war and talked about the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia as the catalyst for a sequence of events that ultimately led to it. It completely upended the lives of so many families in that region. It is a lesson in what can happen when we build walls and focus on our differences rather than our shared values. This week, the conversation turns to his experience arriving in the United States, literally a stranger in a strange land, and what it was like trying to fit in in a place where he didn't know a soul outside of his immediate family and didn't speak the language. Elvira shares some really interesting outsider perspectives on American culture, including his introduction to racism and code switching, that gave me a chance to see my country through a new lens. That's something we all should do from time to time not only to test whether or not the picture we've painted for ourselves is truly all it appears to be, but more importantly, to realize that two people from different backgrounds can look at the same picture and see two completely different things, and that both are equally valid. He goes on to talk about immigration, a real hot-button issue right now, and offers a perspective that native-born Americans need to hear and understand. Most importantly, that many if not most, of the people who arrive as refugees, asylees, and even immigrants who come by choice would rather be in their home countries, but the circumstances have made that difficult, if not impossible. As I say many times in my book, understanding and agreeing are not the same thing. You can understand someone's perspective and still disagree with them, but it is arrogant and small-minded to disagree without even making the effort to see something from another person's perspective. I hope that if you're listening to this podcast, you are the type of person who is interested in expanding your worldview and learning to see things from a different perspective, even if you don't agree with all of it. Thank you for that. If more of us were willing to take that small step, I think it would go a long way toward breaking a lot of the ice that is formed between us as tribes. It may not have much effect in Washington, D.C., but it can have an impact in your community, where you live your life, which is more important to you. Finally, Elvir talks about the work he has done and continues to do in his community. I am truly humbled by what this man has done. As good a person as I like to think I am, and as much as I want to believe I'm doing what I can to help those around me, this guy has set a bar that is truly remarkable. Keeping in mind that he arrived here as a teenager with nothing but a couple bags of clothes, not even speaking the language, and basically getting a pat on the butt and being told, go get him, kid, this dude went and got it. Not only did he navigate a new culture, learn a new language, and scrape and claw his way to barely achieve his high school diploma, Elvir worked his ass off to get through two years of community college, earn a chance to attend a four-year institution, and continue on to earn his master's degree. I don't know about you, but if that was my superhero origin story, I'd have looked around, patted myself on the back for a job well done, and then headed off in pursuit of my interests. Not Elvir. Elvir realized how fortunate he'd been and how much education had changed his life. 
he established the Refugee and Immigrant Scholarship at Virginia Western Community College to help other immigrants, asylees, and refugees get a toehold in his community. If you would like to contribute after listening to his story, I'm posting a donation link in the notes of this episode. Then he did more. He noticed an old tennis court in his neighborhood was always empty. So he lobbied the city council to transform it into a soccer field so the kids in the local community could use it. And then he coached them. Elvier's an example for all of us. If you think you're too small to matter or make a difference, you're wrong. If you think you don't have enough money to change someone's life without negatively impacting your own well-being, you're wrong. Too many of us, myself included, get overwhelmed by the scope of the problem and do nothing as a result. But the goal isn't to fix the world or solve the problem. The goal, the mission, is to love and to lead with agape, the selfless love, and do what you can to nudge your world closer to the ideal that you want to see. If we all provide our own little nudge, the collective impact can be dramatic. I hope this conversation inspires you to find something you're passionate about in your life and community, or motivates you to take action on something you've been thinking about but didn't know how to start and make a difference for someone else. As always, thanks for listening, and please enjoy this conversation with Elvier. Hello? Hello? (sighs) Is anybody out there? Welcome to All the Shit with Tom and Will. Thankfully, my brother and I knew some English. Learning in school and interacting with volunteers that were in the camp, we knew some English. I mean, television shows, movies, whatever, music, we learned some. We arrived to Roanoke. Because Roanoke, at that time, had a family that was here that were able to sponsor us. And there was a small community of Bosnians here at the same time. And obviously, you have the Immigration Center, Catholic Commonwealth Charities, that have been relocating refugees for a long time. Yeah, this was news to me when you told me this, that Roanoke is actually a pretty big hub for refugee right. and immigrant relocations. It's a small town in the middle of Southwest Virginia. To me, someone who's lived in D.C., Atlanta, Denver, to know that Roanoke is actually a pretty big hub for this was eye-opening. Yeah, the people that were here before us that I knew they were also refugees were Vietnamese. And I met a lot of Vietnamese when we came here. My brother's really good friend is Vietnamese. He's still around. So I later find out that the immigration center that currently exists here, the headquarters is in Richmond and also has, I think, Newport News or Hampton or something like that. They have locations there as well. So they're relocating all those areas. But Richmond being the headquarters, so then you got to start somewhere. So they didn't put us in Richmond. They put us somewhere where we'll have a community. And we had a community of Bosnians here when we came here. Not many. But we had a family that was with us in the camp for a short amount of time that was that was here in Rome. There was an older man that was really helping us when we came here in the 90s. He was helping us a lot. His name was Jimmy. And Jimmy was born here, but his family was from Croatia. They came here before World War II. That's when they immigrated. Oh. And he knew some Croatian, so he was able to kind of help us along. And he passed away a couple months back, and I was at the funeral, and I, and I saw them there. And he made a big impact for us when we came here. So that, that family's still here. And when we came here, they help us a lot. You know, it's just taking us to the school and just getting us acclimated. So what was that transition like for you? Because obviously, you know, you knew a little bit of English, but basically, what were you, I guess, 14-ish when you got here? Yeah, I was 14. 14 when I came. My brother was 11. We arrived and Jimmy's sister was an older woman. She was retired. I can take you to, to her house right now. It was in Northwest Roanoke. We lived in her house for a week or two until they found us an apartment. And she spoke a little Croatian. And I remember we arrived late at night, got to her house. They told us where we're going to sleep. I remember waking up the next day in this new country and she made us grilled cheese sandwiches. And I was like, what in the world? Because this is my first time that I saw and experienced a grilled cheese sandwich. And first of all, the the bread was pre-cut. So when we buy it, we buy loaves of bread where, you know, the bread comes out of the oven and here you go. Yeah. You bought a loaf of bread. You go home and you cut it yourself. So it's never machine cut. So this bread came out, it's a square. It's not round. So the thing is square. And that was like my first thought on it. 
and you had cheese in, in between. So, I mean, yeah, we put cheese in our bread, but we never toast it like that. We never melt it down to that point. And she also gave us bologna, and that bologna was fried. So it was like grilled cheese and bologna for breakfast. I remember that first morning experiencing that. What was your impression of the food? Was it, oh, this is good, or like, what is this crap? Initially, it was good because it was new. It was something different. You got to think, we just came from a camp. It's not beans, right? So it's not, yeah. We just came back and it was like, and so even when we start, when we got into the school system, they gave us pizza, pizza and fries. It was very unhealthy. They gave us really unhealthy food. But I was like, this is amazing. We had pizza every other day. You got to think, since I was in the camp, I had pizza from a restaurant maybe once in three years. And I remember my aunt making pizza for us a couple of times, like homemade pizza, which is pretty good itself, but we're just not used to it. It's very rare in those circumstances to have it. So it was like pizza and fries. And I remember the corn dog for the first time. That was interesting. We all have seen what a hot dog looks like and what, what do you call it? Like a, a sausage. We had sausages. We had a type of like, you know, chicken. And so you can, you can fry, you can do whatever you want with it. But I've never seen it fried and put in dough and then fried. I never seen so much fried stuff. We never fried anything, barely. If you cook a chicken, if we're going to have chicken tonight, you're more than likely going to have a whole chicken right in front of you and cut into it. This is the first time I saw chicken separated. Oh, you can buy a part of it now. I was like, that's kind of strange. Chicken nuggets. Never knew what that was. I still don't know what that, what that is, but that was something interesting. So the food, you got to think, we kind of live like, I don't want to say like Amish, but we lived in a way where it's, you knew exactly where the food is coming from. This is pre-war. And you ate fairly healthy. People still eat very healthy over there, but it was just like the food is much different now. We never saw McDonald's. We heard about it, never seen it. Soda, had some. Never in that quantity. I remember having a Coke, and it was a treat, man. To have a Coke, treat. Here, you were able to buy a liter of Coke for 99 cents. I I don't know if you remember that in Walmart back in in the 90s. You know, you just buy a whole thing for 99 cents. So, yeah, like we we bought, we were like Mountain Dew and whatever. We were just having everything in access, like in that first two or three years while we were here. Because you didn't have any of that. All of a sudden, it's like explosion of senses. When she's starting having fast food and really bad like drinks and stuff like that. We were addicted to Mountain Dew. For sure addicted to Mountain Dew. And then we started slowly transitioning out of that. But that first two years was interesting. I can tell you from a perspective for as kids, as somebody who's operating in this new environment. It was, we also had like domestic issues that were happening at the same time. It was just, it was a mess in the first two years. I can imagine your entire world mm-hmm. got pulled out from under you. You dropped into a foreign land that you've only seen in movies. Yeah. And how quickly did you realize that what you saw in movies was not the way things actually were on the ground? I don't know how much you know, but the typical interpretation is people see these large cities. They see New York, Hollywood, and that's what you see on television of what U.S. is. They don't see farmland. Rarely. You know, you watch a, a Western. A lot of people watch Westerns. They watch cowboys. That's what Americans are to some of these people. Just a bunch of cowboys, you know, Wild Wild West. John Wayne was a big movie star over there. I remember first time, like, the TV shows we would watch, that was the reflection of what is here. Beverly Hills 90210, you know, that kind of a thing, right? You remember the 90s. Like, the yeah. 90s were present on television. So the lens that we saw America through is through shows. So you arrive here and it's like, oh, all the houses look the same. That was kind of weird because over there, they don't look exactly the same. And that wasn't shocking, but it was like, it was interesting to see that the houses were made out of wood while over there, they're made out of brick. All the houses are just brick layered. And the yards, uh, the yards were beautiful. Everything was just immaculate. It was also interesting to see so many churches. Especially in this part of the country. Yeah, Yeah. this part of the country, you see so many churches. Everything is so big. I remember we were shocked on the width of the roads. I was like, wow, two cars can go and they can park on the side? Because... You got to imagine, like, Europe is old as crap. And so some of these houses and neighborhoods, they were obviously there before cars. So everything is almost a one-lane type of deal. So the cars had to kind of work their ways, like, okay, you go, now I'll go. And I was just like, the infrastructure wasn't created for cars. Now you come here, it's, God, everything's huge. And so we would have to just get used to the, the magnitude of things. And for the first time immigrant, the experience is I want to experience everything. I want to see how this is, how this tastes, or what this is. And 
you're highly influenced by everything around you. I remember a buddy of mine who was also Bosnian. We would go every Tuesday or Monday, I can't remember, late at night, and we'd go to McDonald's, which is not too far from the apartment complex we were in. And each of us ordered two Big Macs, a bunch of cheeseburgers, fries, and we just load up. Because it was cheap. To us, it was good. And our parents were like, just get out of the house. And it was just like, <laughs> we were just like, that was the kind of weird experience that I think a lot of teenagers had at the time, but not to that point because we were just so interested and intrigued on things. Yeah, it was novel to you. People yeah. who grew up here with it, it was just normal. Yeah, yeah. To be able to buy food through your car, that was a big one. That was a big one. I couldn't, I was like, what? You can just get it by just pulling up with your car? I was like, oh my God. Because over there, you had to walk through everything and walk into things to get stuff, you know? So drive throughs Walmart. To see a Walmart, oh my God. I mean, we had grocery stores, but to have everything, we were just fascinated by the size of things because we were we come from a small country, small place. Yeah. Then you also know, notice the lack of things, a lack of people on the road, like people who walk on the road, people who bike as a mode of transportation, lack of places to like as you're walking to sit down and grab a drink or grab some coffee or something like that. You have to drive to places. So that was something that we also saw. So and sometimes like you would, you know, you couldn't find certain ingredients. It's like, oh, I want to make this thing, but that ingredient really doesn't exist here. It's not here. You know, later on it became available because you had a store. So it's like, there's two things that were existing. Like there was this abundance of certain thing, but like lack of this other thing. And then at the same time, you know, the language barrier to understand why things are happening. Going back to how I was experiencing refugee camp, I brought that into this country as well. I was kind of a hesitant on speaking because English wasn't, I was not that good at it. And like I knew some things. I was, I was going to school. I was just figuring it out still. So I didn't speak. I didn't talk to a lot of people. I was kind of shy, you know, never raised my hand in class. So obviously if you don't participate, if you're not engaged with the material that you're learning, you're going to be you're the opposite. You're disengaged. You're like, I'll never figure this out. I was just hanging in with my people. Which can cause a problem now. Now you're kind of like trying to figure out where you belong. You're just under one country. It's telling you one way to succeed. You learn the language. It, it, we're still in the survival mode that first three years almost. You're constantly connected to still your people because that's where the safety is. They're like you. So they get you. So in that community, are you only speaking Bosnian? Predominantly. Because first of all, you don't have a car. So you're not traveling. You're not going anywhere. So you're constantly hanging out with the same people. And the people that you were hanging out with are those that you can you know, not struggle too much with speaking with, which is a bunch of Bosnians. Thankfully, and the reason why I say thankfully, that there weren't too many of them, that you would come forced to interact with Americans. So you can get beyond the barrier. But that first year, I mean, eighth grade, you're kind of looked at like an exotic species or something like that. They're like, all right, what's this white kid doing? So, I mean, I remember going to Woodrow Wilson and kids were kind of interested in me because they, were, they started making fun of me because I was wearing the same clothes a lot. You know, as a kid, we didn't have, I mean, especially in the camp, we didn't have a lot of clothes. And so if it's not stinky or dirty, you can wear it again. And that's how I was. And I continued to doing that until I was like, oh, in America, they change clothes every day. They have new pairs of whatever every single day. I remember that happening. Um, I remember them asking me a lot how to say certain things because they wanted to cuss out their teachers and stuff like that. They wanted to learn how to say certain words. So... I was like, this is how you say it. And they would say it and snicker and laugh and whatever. But to them, it was funny. To me, it was it was just trying to make friends and all that. So yeah, you're trying to fit yeah, in any way you can. In. Yeah, yeah. So the whole goal in that first two or three years is this sort of the fit in thing. That was the survival mode to fit in. Am I fitting in? I'm not ostracized for anything. And the great thing about it, what I realized, nobody cares what religion you are. That's cool. You just came from an area with a lot of people care what religion you are. How about... I'm guessing in Eastern Europe, you didn't see a lot of different races. Had you ever seen a black person, black person. prior to coming here? Um, we had, his name is Mark Chono is his name. Mark came from South Africa as a volunteer. And he was the first black man that came to the camp. And Mark was this nicest, kindest, carefree just an amazing human being. And I, you know, by the way, just any volunteer that came through that camp is like a family now. You know, it's just, it is what it is. You just can't separate them from my own family anymore. They became your family during that time because they gave so much of themselves. I learned a lot from that experience. Mark was the first person that I interacted that is a different race than I am. 
And my first impression of him, it was just this amazing, kind-hearted human being who just gave his time to care for, to, to, to do something with, because he was there to care for children and not in terms of like care, provide you food and, and necessities. No, but like he, he was like games and activities and just to get you engaged and all these other things. That was his thing. He put a lot of himself into that. And I still keep in contact with him. Facebook is amazing. So that's the one amazing part about it. It just continues to connect you with people. And he still does a lot of stuff with refugees, surprisingly. Not surprisingly, really. But Mark was the first one. So when they placed us here, they placed us in Northwest Rono, predominantly immigrant and African-American community. I went to high school that had 60% black. And then some immigrants, mostly white, in like 40%, 30% white, some immigrants in there, some Hispanics, but not as much as it's now. I had all sorts of friends in high school. Most of my immediate friends at the time were obviously Bosnians, people who were get me, understand me. And then once the years went by, you started befriending a lot more people, white, black, doesn't matter. Everybody was connecting on some, on some shape of form. So people saw me as a white kid, but a different white kid. I didn't have the sort of heritage that a lot of white kids carried here. And we came back from a war. And not only that, a lot of Bosnians that came here are Muslim. We never saw ourselves as that. We never like, oh, I'm a Muslim. I never prayed, never abide by anything, but you're part of that group. Just solely on your name, the reasons why you're here. So when we came here, it's like, oh, there's other Muslims. Oh, okay. W where? And they're like, those people over there. And they're all black. The cool thing about it is now they see you as brothers because that's what you're taught to see other Muslims as. They're all brothers and sisters, like any religion really it should be, but they were like seen us as brothers. So now we hung out a little bit. There was a little more connection there. They just saw me differently. They're a different set of eyes. And especially if you're an immigrant, obviously people make fun of each other a lot, but I was strategic. I was not made fun of a lot. Like I was just like lower level. They make fun of you a little bit, but you don't get, you don't understand it. So you just skate through and you don't draw a lot of attention to yourself. I had a really good friend during that time, this guy named Jason. Jason came from Florida during the same time that I came from Bosnia. And we find ourselves always in the same classes together. Jason's a white guy. We connected because he was a newcomer, I was a newcomer. He didn't have a lot of friends and I didn't either. So we connected and while we were in school. I was even the best man at his wedding. That's how things transition. We don't keep it in touch as much as we used to. Life just took us in a different direction, but he was a great guy. I connected even some of the, because I went to high school here, I played football. That was a weird experience. To play a sport that you'd never played ever. You just saw it on TV. Yeah. And so I was on a football team with 40 other guys. And there was only like three or four other white kids on there. I was one of those. Being a kicker, you're more than likely to be a white kid than not. But I was a kicker. I scored. I hung out with them. We went, had food together before games. We traveled to different places. We practiced every single day together. Went to the same classes together. And now I contacted them. They contact me like we were on Facebook. How's it going? It's like these, these connections are still there just because you were on the same team together. I don't think people saw race a lot if you're on the same team together. At least I didn't. We were just like, we were wearing the same colors. We were yeah. against that team. I think people carry that. If you just put people on the same team and say, you're on the same team and our mission is this, I think mission is the first thing. People don't see color. It's there. It's present, but it's not as a, as a primary thing. So if you start making a connection around a unified thing, then I think some... It thing. becomes a secondary attribute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's still part of the equation, but it's not such a huge part of the equation. You have an interesting opportunity as an immigrant, specifically as a refugee. Because as you mentioned, you can now connect with people. White boys see you as a white boy. Other races see you as a white boy, but not in the same vein as an American white right, boy, yeah, right? Like yeah. you were talking about, you don't have the same cultural history. And so you can connect with everybody on a different level in a way that people who were born, born here, here yeah. have a different history and a different narrative that goes with that. And you didn't have that narrative. So you were almost like an open source software. Yeah. Blank slate. Yeah. Yeah, it's how it was. Like, I, when I tell people what high school I went to, depending on what neighborhood I'm in in Roanoke, I'm telling what high school I went to. And I, I notice how people relate to me differently. If I tell somebody who was in Southeast Roanoke, Southwest Roanoke, or you know, somebody who went to a county school or other part that's predominantly white, oh, you went to William Fleming. Oh, okay. Or something like that. And then I, I remember talking to a security officer at the place where I work, this black man who was like a class of, I think, 89 or 90. 
a Fleming, and I was like, "Hey, I went to William Fleming." He's like, "But really?" And so this this whole demeanor changed of how who I am, just based on the school I went to. It's like, "Oh, you went? What school?" It's like, "Oh, you know these people?" Yeah. So automatically, it's like, "Oh, we have a shared thing." So it's just like every time we see each other, it's like, "What's going on?" And you know, things. It's like even simply the school you went to for that four years, your experience was defined by that. We have to go in depth and about you know having domestic issues at home, and then you go into your high school. And, you know, you're trying to find a, a, a father figure inside that school or maybe multiple of them. They're typically in a coach teacher level or counselor. And all of these coaches were black men while I went to high school. And so you see people in the different light. So Mark, they came to a refugee camp. He was a 20 year old black male, right? The most influential men that I had in my early years were black men. That's somebody that's trying to keep you in line in a way. I was never a kid who was in trouble or anything like that. But these people tried to do a, trying to work on their community through people, through influencing young men. And they were all black men. So that's my first like four years of the United States. That's my connection to black people, the race, the influence, the kind heartedness, the struggle that came along to get to a certain point, the work. I didn't know, and I, I only later on realized, it's like, oh man, these people are continually, even now they're seen as a sort of second-class citizens just by the culture that was built in this country. I realized that I'm a privileged person because simply by my race. Yeah. You know, and that's later on. I only found that out after high school. I didn't know that. All the way through high school, that never came up. It was just, you were just part yeah. of the group. I was walking in, I, and every time I step out of my house, and I go into a place where you are a minority. I didn't see many Bosnians there or many immigrants. I saw a majority of black people. Obviously, there's white people there, but a majority of black people. A majority of counselors and coaches were black. Okay, so this is the reality of the world. This is my world, right? Influenced by the music, what you wear, all these other things. So that's who you are. And then when I went to college, that's what things changed. That's where I was like, oh, crap. There's, there's not many black people out here right? Higher education, there's not many. And that's where another part of culture shock happened. It really depends on the environment that you walked into. Yeah, that's true. Interestingly enough, I feel like I had a similar experience in a way being in a military family. Yeah. Because it's all integrated. And so when you're on a base, you're going to base schools, especially if you live abroad. Yeah. I had a lot of black classmates. I didn't look at them differently. And it wasn't a part of the military culture to be dividing people up by race. Yeah. That I didn't really learn until I got to Virginia. And that's where I did middle school, high school, and college. Same thing. It was, I didn't realize how much difference it was. And even being in Virginia, where we lived, it was a military area. So it was a much more diverse population. Mm -hmm. But then going to college, oh, yeah. and I went to Mary Washington College yeah. and MWC, people would joke that meant mostly white college. Which was absolutely true. Yeah. I think I could count the number of black people in my class on one hand. The president of the Black Student Union was a white guy at my college. Like, it's crazy to think about. And I didn't see it that way until then. And so I feel like I've been playing catch up in a lot of ways. Different than you, I didn't have as many influential black men in my life, yeah. but I also didn't look at them as different necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I think a lot of us, we all always have an opportunity. We just never intentionally put ourselves in a situation to interact with people who are not like us. We don't either have a need or have an internal drive to do that. I was placed in Northwest Roanoke. I was placed to go to William Fleming High School. And the choice was for me to play in a football team. But I'm thankful for that experience because I get to interact with people who are definitely not like me. They had completely different experiences. Very accepting and all that, but different experiences, different language, all these other things. I didn't have a choice. A lot of people do. A lot of people have a choice and people choose the comfort level. They want to be around people who are like them, who yeah. understand them, will get them, who are, you know, who you don't have to guess. It goes all the way back to what we talked about at the very beginning when I hit record on this thing. We were talking about iPhones and Androids, right? Mm -hmm. And you can pick what group you want to be in yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. Of course. You are all trying to find that connection. What I find most interesting about you is the first time we met, like I had heard about you because our wives are friends at the gym. And so because I don't go to the gym, she tells me everything that happens at the gym and about all of her friends or whatever. And then I met you for the first time. And I think the second time we hung out, we went and got coffee and sat down and talked for like two hours. Mm -hmm. 
And we were immediately on that deep level of connecting beyond just the surface level stuff. Yeah. And so I recognized in you someone like me who is very interested in just meeting and experiencing different people, different cultures, different ways of life and understanding how people work beyond that. And that was refreshing for me. To your point, I think it is easier not to seek that, especially for people who haven't traveled much or haven't experienced a lot of the world. And that's one of the advantages of being a military kid is you're forced into different situations, right. different cultures, different even parts of this country are so different. Oh, yeah. So for me, it was natural and normal. But if you are born and raised in a small town or even in a single city, you don't have the breadth of experience. And so it's easier to just stay as a point of least resistance, stay with the people and the culture I know, and to seek something else or to try and find what else is out there. There's risk associated with that. The safety and the ease keep us siloed. But I think to your point, what you're saying is if you push a little more, you peel back a few layers of that onion, you realize not only do we have a lot more in common than we think in most cases, but man, you get some of the best experiences of your life by stepping outside of that box. Yeah, you get to learn a lot about yourself in that experience. And, and you, you allow people to learn about you. You got to think that for some people to go through simple things in life, just going to work. Just dressing up and going to work or going to school, doesn't matter what it is. You have to go from comfort to discomfort every single day, meaning you have to be someone else. You have to pretend to be a certain way. You're, you're using coded language. You're all these other things as soon as you step out. And you'll be surprised how many people go through that. Many people go through that. It's like, all right, I got to put on my face, as people would say. You got to obviously act professional in certain environments. You can't say certain things. You have to bite your tongue or you find yourself being frustrated by certain people because they're not aware. There are people who continuously go to that. I don't necessarily have to go through that experience. There are times where I'll be in a meeting or I'll be in, a, in an environment where it's like, I really could say something right now, but it's going to lead into this other thing. And I don't want to get into that. Or I would hear something that it seems where it is, stereotypical in nature. Or it's a, I guess, a view that needs to be, it hasn't been educated. There's no education behind it. It hasn't been like. Can you give me an example? You don't have to use names or specifics, but. I had a coworker who called me one time and he's the type of person that jokes a lot. Me and him joke a lot. I many different points. I make fun of him. He makes fun of me. We just say stuff that it's kind of lighthearted in a way, you know. But some people just think that it's okay to do other things as well. And so he called me one time, and I'm a point person for a lot of people in the community. And he called, and I can tell it's a male calling me, but the accent is very Middle Eastern, Eastern European. So this guy is putting on this accent asking for a location of something. I can't really remember it, but he was going on for about a minute. And it's on my cell phone. And because I couldn't recognize the number, it's like I exit my office because I don't want him to break up and it's like to understand him better. So I go outside and I go to this conference room trying to get who this is. I got my pen and paper ready, you know, and then, oh, man, it's, you know, it's me. It's, you know, he just drops the accent down. So I'm like, OK, I know he likes to joke, but this this guy, he just made fun of, I don't know, made fun of immigrants. Did he just do that or did he because it sounded almost like. I mean, my dad and my mom have really thick Eastern European accents. Sometimes it's hard to understand them. And I can make fun of them. I can be like, uh, this is how my parents sound. And it's very thick. But I have that right. I have that ability. And it's my choice to, you know, yeah. make fun of all myself, really, in a way. Right. But what gave you that right? Some people just become comfortable thinking that certain things can pop through. And he thought that is just something to, to say. That... It would make me laugh, but just because of who he is and how he jokes about stuff and other contextual things that came in, in many different instances, that wasn't cool. Like it wasn't cool with me. So I had to confront him at some point. It's like, you know, you, you need to know when to say something and when not to say something. A lot of people don't know what's okay, what's not okay. Some people think because we are at a certain level of relationship that you can just say things and think that it's okay. And I don't know how people gauge that. My advice to that. Just be cautious about that on any of your levels. If you're not invited into that conversation, don't be part of that conversation. That was just one experience that it's recent that I can... How did he respond to that when you brought it up with him? He apologizes. Like, if there's anything I said that offended you, I'm really sorry. And I said, yeah, that, that's fine, but you need to just 
somebody needs to the thing is we let a lot of stuff slide and easier not to create conflict yeah you get used to it you get callous to some things and so you don't want to get to a point where you're just like all right i'm probably going to just waste my time here explaining this because if it doesn't happen in front of me it happens in the closed doors that kind of a thing mm -hmm. language can do a lot of different all right here's an example the definition of how we define immigrants that cross the border in southern parts of america through mexico so the language that was used illegal aliens you remember that language yeah you? yeah absolutely and then all right aliens even the green card that you would get it would be like permanent alien oh my god and then it was permanent resident and then language around illegal immigrants okay how can anybody be illegal yeah and then definition of around undocumented immigrant is the final version of that somebody had to take you through the process of that evolution of it's no longer okay to use this language because it does something it puts people into a certain box. Mm -hmm. And now when you put them into the box, you treat them a certain way. Laws were made around certain languages, how language is used. So if you change how language is used, then you're going to possibly change how law is being implemented because you're, you're dealing with people. So now it, a person can be undocumented. You just simply don't have documentation that shows that you have all the rights. Meaning if I am a permanent resident, I have certain things that it's like, all right, I can work. I can do all these other things. Kind of like... If I'm a, I'm a citizen, I have a right to vote, right? Undocumented, you have rights as a human being. You, you have right to be treated, to process a law, all these other things. You probably can't vote or right off pay taxes, all these stuff, because you're going to have the documentation. People skirt that all the time. This is where my wife and I get into these discussions about refugees and immigrants. Refugees, as soon as you walk in here, you have documentation. You can get a lot of different resources. If you are undocumented, you just, you're fighting for your life. You don't have nothing, you know? Work? That's what you got? You can just work. If you're thinking life for refugees is, and I say refugees, those are who, who given that status, or asylees given that status, there are different people who get into this country without documentation. They're much worse off in terms of getting to a quote unquote comfortable level of life because they're already a couple of notches down in terms of working up to a certain, takes them a longer time. So that's why, that's why people work so hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's all you got. That's a conversation Will and I had. The idea that someone who is willing to, and speaking specifically about immigrants, someone who's willing to look at their situation and realize it is so bad that they are willing to pull up everything they've ever known, make a journey that is very dangerous, and everything that goes with that, the planning, the risk, all of that, put their kids through that same situation. They're not coming here to just hang out. You have to have a certain level of work ethic and drive to not only make that journey, but to make it happen on the other side once you get here. And I think that's something that's lost on a lot of Americans because we are used to having everything handed to us. And not everyone is rich, I don't mean in that way, but you have the opportunities available to you. Many people still don't take advantage of all the opportunities that's presented to them because it's hard. You still have to make an effort. So to me, if you're doing all that to get here, that's not the type of person that I want to turn away. That's someone who has something to offer to give and is willing to work for it. In my opinion, the immigrant families and communities that I've seen and been a part of, and when I say been a part of, I mean not truly been a part of, but in Denver, the area that we lived in was heavily Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of them, at least at some point along the line, did not come through the normal channels. Mm -hmm. But also some of the strongest work ethic I've seen, some of the strongest families I've seen. And I admire that. I think that's something that, especially if you live in a small town, and it's different here because we are relatively far from the border. It's not like we live in Texas and we see people flowing across all the time. So we're imagining what that would be like. But just like when you were watching movies in Bosnia and imagining what America was like, the reality is much different when you're actually in it and you see it. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I think... For me, I'm basically living in the most diverse country that I've known and I've read about. It's in a way a melting pot, but at the same time, it's just, it's a mixture of different cultures, different values, and different identities mashed up in one. But at the same time, those individual parts still exist. So I can only talk about Roanoke right now. Certain parts of Roanoke are more populated with certain demographics than others. We still live in a very segregated environment. The work ethic is there because there's obviously opportunity. 
But at the same time, there's a large need. No person that I know that immigrated here, including me, really wanted to come here. None of us want to be here. We want to be in our own countries, having a good life, having a normal life where we're raising our families and just going about how life should be. Or, But circumstances were such that you had to leave. And if you are given another shot, you're going to take that. And you're going to work hard to never be in a situation where you struggled. That's why you're going to put 110% into building something here, leaving an imprint for your family and being that, you know, and people realize here that in order to get to a next level, you have to do it with others. It's hard to do it by yourself. And so that's why you see so much connection between all these families, tight knit groups, tight communities, because they help each other. All you got is person next door, somebody who's in the next room, you know, your family members. So I think the work ethic, it comes with fear of not having to be in a certain place, not having to be in fear of not having. So yes, of course, people work hard. Immigrants work hard a lot, but because there's a reason why you need to do that. I don't know one person, immigrant, not immigrant, would want to work 12 hours a day in construction, right? It's hard, hard work. It messes you up. But you need to do that. There's no other exit out. I mean, all right, so we came here. I don't have, we don't have land. Came here with a couple bags. Now you got to have to make a living for yourself. What are you going to do? Just like work eight hours a day? No. Eight hours a day is a minimum you're going to be working. You ain't working 10 to 12 hours a day. And you're going to take as much overtime as you can to make money. Because the first family that comes here are making that money for themselves in this country and sending a third of it back home. So you're working for not only yourself, not only for your family, but probably your brother or your cousins or whatever that you're sending money to. That's what's happening. You're working for 10 people. So yeah, you're going to work eight hours a day? You can. And you're not going to make a lot of money, especially if you're getting paid low wage. Which, if you're getting paid under the table, you're going to be getting paid low wage. That's right. So, work ethic is there, yeah. Yeah, that's what you're seeing. Yeah, they're working hard. But why are they working so hard? You think they want to work 12 hours a day? Nobody wants to. They want to be with their families. That's right. why you see half of them sometimes bring their own kids with them. Bring your kids to work. And put this payment down. So, it's just, it is what it is. So, tell me what you do now. Because all of your history, this whole story that you've been unraveling for me. You've seen so much. You've been helped along the way by people like Mark, by people like Jimmy. And now you have a chance to give back. And I love your story that you shared with me about what you've done in the community. Can you talk about what that is and what A, drove you to it and B, what you get out of it? I think it started off with it, you come to this country, if you're most knowledgeable on how to use your language and you know how to speak it, you're automatically a person in the community that everybody just reach out to help them translate something. Hey, can you look at this documentation for me? I had this credit card that came in the mail. Can you activate it for me? This check needs to be sent to blah, blah, blah. Can you help me write it? These are initial things at age 15 and 16. So you, you start off with like simple stuff. I need a, a license to drive my car. I need to go to DMV with me and help me with this because I need to get to work. Insurance. <laughs> All this other stuff, just the simple, I need to live and figure stuff out. It started off with that. It started off with just simply being an interpreter for my family and for my neighborhood, basically. <laughs> yes. And then people are like, people give you little rewards. Here's $10. Here's some cookies. Now you're a kid. You're a 15, 16-year-old. Time goes by. I go to college. Now I'm getting advanced level of English under my belt. Now I'm getting... I guess you would say more complex requests to help with things. And that would be like my parents asking me for stuff and others like asking me just small, small little things just to help them with, you know, I remember helping my mom and dad apply for their citizenship, process of paperwork, all this other stuff, simple things like that. And I noticed that I'm sought after and I enjoy helping. I enjoy being somebody's asking, it's like, hey, I need your help with X, Y, and Z. Now I finished college. Now I have all these tools in my tool belt, if you will. So I'm able to use that to help others. I remember completing graduate school and trying to figure out what to do and found a job as a tutor, tutoring English to elementary school kids and middle school kids. And what was your degree in? Communications. Master's in communications from Radford. 
I didn't know what to do with that. I really, I was just fascinated by the program I was in and the material I was learning. I was taken back about it. I was like, this is amazing. And I'm learning the intricacies of human interaction and the list goes on. When I started tutoring, I was fascinated by it. Not that I wanted to become a teacher, but I was interacting with kids from parts of the neighborhood that I lived in. There are a bunch of elementary school kids and some of them are immigrants just learning English and learning math problems and just simple stuff, grammar, reading, writing kind of a deal. Did that with elementary school and, and middle school kids for maybe two years or so, part-time. Then I found a full-time job in higher education I was a registrar at a community college type level. I was also an adjunct professor. So I'm constantly helping somebody learn something to get them to the next level. And I realized how much education is done for me. And I wanted to bring that to my community and make it a little more accessible. So when I started interacting with, as a coach now, in 2013, with a bunch of immigrant kids, mostly refugees from Nepal. There were some kids from Afghanistan, some kids, a couple of different countries, Burundi, they're all just a bunch of middle school, high school kids who just loved playing soccer and were trying to find their way. And I was there to make sure that they know that the next level is accessible. I had this idea if they want to stick around, and a lot of immigrants do want to stick around because it costs a lot to go to a, a four-year college. They're probably going to hang out at a two-year college for like a community college. So I created a scholarship, started off really low. I got $1,000 donated through some of my colleagues. I said, I want to start this scholarship. They are requesting $1,000. I don't have that. So I'm asking a couple of you people <laughs> to give me your money so we can start this. So they were like, all right, here's, here's a couple of bucks. Here's a couple of bucks. Couple. So I got to $1,000. I donated that. I put that with uh, Virginia Western Community College. They created a scholarship in 2016. And that scholarship already helps 14, 15 people. And you know, as a requirement, you need to have documentation that you are in this country and having some legal document that says that you are either in process of obtaining your asylum here or you just came here as a refugee. And there's different other like language around what categorizes you as somebody who's seeking asylum. It helps, I think, two people per year. We raise the dollar amount because people are donating. People saw the need. And so I did that. And that itself, that the great thing about itself, I don't have to manage it too much. It's just all I have to do is speak very heavily about it and people would donate it. If you go to Virginia Western website, you can see where you can donate for all the scholarship and the Refugee and Immigrant Annual Scholarship is there. You can make your donation and a lot of people do. It's a way to welcome people. I saw the need, especially for the adult community, because you would be able to come here. For example, at age 40, you come from Afghanistan or something like that. You were an engineer or doesn't matter what you are. You have a degree, yet that degree doesn't necessarily translate here. Right. And you would love to do exactly what you were doing for 20 plus years because you have the experience. But I need a degree. I need to show a piece of paper that says I can be an engineer. Yet I don't have access to financial aid right now because I'm still going through the process of regular documentation that allows me to have health care and stuff like that. But this scholarship is open to you. You would just get your $1,000 so you can get you back into school. You don't have to wait too long to restart your life in a way. That's awesome. I'm going to go ahead and post the link to okay. that scholarship fund in the description for this episode. And hopefully we can spread the word about that. You just decided to do this on your own. Who'd you reach out to to start it? And how did you get connected to get the scholarship funded? I'm an alumni of it. I went to Virginia Western. I reached out to them and I said, I don't see any scholarships that target this population. And I would like to make that available. I would like to have that be an opportunity for you to have more of this community be part of and get education here. But I also like them to benefit from coming to a place where they're very much stranger to it. I think it's a way to welcome others, to say, you're welcome here. You're part of this community. And how do you know you're part of this community? It's unless you communicate that you are wanted. Simple things like having access to finances to get education because it's very expensive here. And people don't have that money. Like I just said, you're working eight to 10 hours a day just to pay your bills. But at the same time, you're also working for other people. You're working for your family and probably you're sending money to overseas. It would be very nice that you can continue your education and not worry about finances so much, which many people who were born and raised here are also worried about. That's how I sold it to Virginia Western, and they were on board from the get-go. Thankfully, they just made it happen within a couple of months, and we got it going. And, and it's great to see it flourish and great to see people communicate with me and say, hey, I just donated, and, and 
Well, I always tell people, like, especially the people who initially made that donation to start it off, mm -hmm. I get a letter every year saying, hey, these two people were awarded this scholarship money. They're going to be celebrated this time of year. And I always show up at those little celebrations, the war celebrations. But I take a, a screenshot of that letter and I send it to all the people that donated the, that initial sum to get it started. Because it's such a, I want to tell people that it's really, I'm just a sort of like a liaison to this. You are the, the catalyst that, that got it moving. So it takes a community, man. It takes a village. I'm at the point where I didn't get this by myself. I didn't get here by myself. It really is the people. So if you realize that it's really those connections that got you to this level of success, quote unquote success or freedom and or, or just comfort level that you are there to help others to do the same. So scholarship is, was the one way to do it. Building a little futsal court that we talked about, the little to refurbish a tennis court in the community that doesn't play tennis, that plays soccer all the time. And just working with the city to do that, to say, hey, let's make something a little more culturally appropriate and accessible and a resource, a recreational resource that people can recognize as soon as they walk past it because soccer is played everywhere. It was a no brainer. It's just, you just need representation. You just need somebody to say, hey, I'm here to speak for these people and then push through. That's why you need so many different people in the room when you're talking about important issues. You know, we're talking about, oh, bringing people to the table. We are the table, man. The table is here. There's no bringing people to any table. You're not going anywhere. It's go where it's needed. You're in a community that needs your input, needs other people's input. And people need, you need access to communication. It's, I'm, I'm always surprised how much I say, oh, it's something is happening for this community. But there's so many things happening in various small little communities that it's not necessarily recognized, but people are moving and shaking things around, making things better. Yeah. In many different places. I just loved hearing those stories because if you're not a part of those communities, a lot of times it's not reported on. Nobody knows that it's happening. And if it's unseen, that can perpetuate some of the ideas that, well, nothing's happening. It's yeah. just everyone's laying around absorbing yeah. and not contributing. Yeah. So how do you amplify that and share what you're doing? For example, how do you reach and communicate to the people who are eligible for that scholarship that it's available? First, you have to find out how people get information. Everything is on social media. Everything is on the phones. That's the first line of communication. Second is they have to receive it from a source that they trust. Speaking to others about it is very necessary. And those important individuals and those, they all exist. Everybody has a spokesman, spokespeople for that community. And there's many of them. There's people who are just moving around and, and trying to do good things and are doing the great things. And if you just target that and notify and speak to them and, and make them part of the decision making when, when something is happening then everybody has a stake in it. So if let's say you're going to build a basketball court in a community, and I'm just giving an example because that's the easiest one right now. You want to build it somewhere where you know that there is a need. So people on board are like, yeah, I want to play basketball. I don't want to walk too far from my house. I have to walk. I have to take a bus or I have to you know, drive to two or three blocks away or to another neighborhood to do it. Why can't I just do the same recreational resource in my own neighborhood? So there's going to be a push, there's going to be a need. And people are like, how do you know that there's a need? And the reason why there's a need, because people are choosing to find a different type of recreational resource. And it's like, well, what if you build a community center? What if you build a blah, blah, blah there where people use it? You'd be surprised how many people would want to be part of that conversation rather than be like, why well, do you want to take my money and tax me for it or something like that? People want to be part of the solution. You're just not making it accessible. People want to be part of the solution too. They just don't know how. Yeah. I think a lot of times it just lacks a leader or a central voice. Yeah. And so you were able to provide that in two instances with the scholarship and then getting that right. soccer field built. Right, right. So as you look forward, what's on the horizon for you? That's a great question. These are things that I think they're just a catalyst for another way to, to incorporate myself into this community. And I think my growth has always been, and I've always believed that education is a way out of a situation or even into a situation that you want to be in. So to me, what got me to this point, even to talk to you right now, and the language that's not native to me is education, simply reading, writing, and then exploring the world through, to me, it was higher education that got me to this level. So if I can put myself in a situation where I can get to to the next level, to where they want to be in life, then that would be my purpose in life. So whether it be building community recreational centers, whether it be creating more opportunity through financial means, through 
I guess, opportunities to get engaged in the community. Like if you're, if you're interested in healthcare, I mean, I currently work in healthcare. If you want to learn more, like you just need to know that I'm there so you can contact me and I can point you in the right direction. I got to a point where I know some people and I know people who always want to assist. I'm always surrounded by people who want to help, but certain people don't have connections to those connections. Right. So now you're in a room where you can be a voice and that's what I want to continue to be. I can be a voice. I want to be a resource and I want to make sure that people are connected because that's the central piece to it. Going back to the first initial thing we said in this conversation, it's all about connection. That's the part that takes us to the next level. And I think that's something we forgot that we have at our disposal. That is the sort of the, not, that's the easiest thing we can do. And we don't utilize connections. I think it's getting easier and easier to live in a silo, yeah. which can be as small as one person yourself yeah, yeah. because everything is digital everything can be delivered to you there's no need to get into the community from a scientific survival perspective right but i think to truly be human and to live in any type of a communal setting you need that interpersonal connection it has to be in person it can't be zoom meetings it can't be just facebook if you really want to connect it has to be in person but again that takes effort and I think it just means that collectively we need to make that effort and encourage our neighbors to make that effort to go be a part of the community. Yeah. And I'm guilty of it as anybody. We met because I would occasionally go to the gym on Saturday. We live 30 minutes outside of town, so it's an effort to get anywhere. I have a gym in my basement, at least the essentials. You don't have to go anywhere. Yet. I don't have to go anywhere. And I'm lazy. I'm inherently lazy, <laughs> right? But the thing that gets me to the gym I mean, I haven't been in a while because I've been working on this project and sure. putting stuff together. But yeah. the thing that motivates me to go is to be around the people. I can work out anywhere. Getting to hang out with you, getting to meet you on a night going to dinner mm -hmm. with you and your wife. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that really bring me back to life. I and mean, sometimes you don't realize how deflated you are. I think a lot of people can get depressed, anxious, just that feeling of fidgety energy of, I know I want to do something, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times all that is, is go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be a friend. It could be a stranger. Make a new friend. But put yourself out there. Share who you are and let someone share who they are. And you fill each other up that way. Sure. I think it's uh, it's also a matter of circumstance. Just talking about the environment that we exist in. Like, all right. So example is we go to the gym that costs some money for you to attend this gym and work out. Put physical effort each and every day. All right. Which is a pri in itself a privileged Absolutely. Environment yeah. to be in. Yep, it's a barrier to entry. Right. You're in an environment that is accessible to you based on certain socioeconomic level that you have access to. And yeah, you go into it because A, you want to and you can. So both of those things are can and want to. It's, it's a privileged kind of a environment to be in. All that brings, I guess, certain way to make a decision about anything. So if you're going to go eat, you can go to a restaurant and be like, yeah, I can afford to go to a place where I can get a plate for, you know, 20 bucks. Where some people are, it's like, man, I can't spend more than $10 on this plate. Yes, I'm going to go into a place where majority of people who are certain socioeconomic levels tend to be immigrants, people who are at lower level of a socioeconomic ladder. They go there. So you're now exposed to like variety of people because majority of people are not that privileged. If you're a certain level of economic bracket, you're in a smaller minority. It's mostly white people over certain, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's your environment, man. Part of it is choice. Part of it is the circumstance. You can't blame yourself for it for being in that spot. You can't feel guilty about that or anything like that because all of those people want to be at that level too. It's not... True, you know, but you're saying there's also then a responsibility if you are in that more fortunate bracket. There's a personal responsibility on some level Maybe it's not a responsibility, but you would behoove yourself to make yourself available and introduce yourself to other people outside of your spectrum. There's a lyric in a song that I heard. It was a, it's a rap song in Bosnia. It's like, I know people who are a-holes and have money, but I know people who are a-holes and don't have money. So your character speaks a lot more. Basically, don't be an a-hole. Money, no money, right? There are people with money who tend to look down on others. Because they're in a certain level or it's looking down kind of a thing. Treating them like they're just less than, like they can pay them to do anything and that's how things work. Yeah, so that don't do that. You can be walking around with a crap ton of money, 
and what you do with it is is really your business but you can do a lot with it if you choose to in terms of helping others if that's your life goal the goal is not to use your level to have a negative impact on anybody I think that's where it really depends how that privilege is used. For example, my privilege is using connections. I have a privilege to be connected to certain people who certain populations don't and immigrants don't. But I'm using that privilege to say, oh, okay, so there's a resource for that? All right, let me make a call. And then just tell others about it. Hey, there's this thing. You can apply for it. You can find it. Here's a link to it. Yeah, you turn around and help the next guy in line. Right. Yeah. So there you go. So it's how do you use that access that you have to certain information. Yeah, but I mean, to even to start that, you have to understand the community that you're trying to help too. Certainly. Right? Yeah, you can't just go in there and be like, all right, here I am, I'm here to help. Right. That never worked out for anybody. That's just not the way you should go about stuff. But it starts small, man. It always starts small. We have a janitorial staff in our building. I can tell how other people treat them. I'm wondering if how many people around me know these people's names. Yeah, probably not too many. Not too many. Start small. Hey, Jeff, how are you doing today? How's your day going? Jeff, I called him by, this is a human being with a first name, last name. They have a life, possibly have a family. I don't know. It's just small interactions like that. And that's doesn't cost anything. Man. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to the episode where I interviewed my father-in-law, Honest Dad. But he made this same point, and this is the point I've been circling around. He said, for him, part of living in community we want to solve poverty is the way he looked at it. But you have to be in their house and they have to be in your house. And what he meant by that is you can't look at someone as less than and expect to have truly unified community. So to your point, there are people in lower socioeconomic brackets in his neighborhood whom he's befriended over the years. And it's not necessarily a financial aid situation, but it's a human connection situation. And it's lifted him and allowed him to see people on a human level that until you pull away that veil from your own eyes to say, this person lives in a single bedroom house with 12 other people from their family. I don't want to have anything to do with that. You can put a wall up and you can block that out and continue to live in your bubble. Or you can take that wall down and say, hey, let me get to know you. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be funneling money to you. And they probably don't want that. That's not what they want. They want to be treated with equality. They want to be seen as a peer on that human level. And that's more valuable than taking a handout. But it's creating that connection. Like you're talking about knowing the custodian's name, knowing that that's a person who's going through the same struggles I am. We have different money situations, but life is still kicking us in the balls the same way. That's the kind of thing that I think we need to do more of collectively. And I'm trying to be better at it. I'm trying to be more cognizant of it when I see it to make those efforts. I just got back from a trade show in Las Vegas and I'm sitting at the booth all day and custodial staffs come by emptying the garbage. I made a point to talk to those guys and just say, hey, thank you for doing this. Nobody else even looks at them. But it's, they're doing their job. But man, if you see someone cleaning the bathroom or emptying garbage cans, do you think that was their choice? Like their number one goal when they were thinking about as a kid, what you want to be when you grow up? I would love to scrub toilets professionally in a casino. No. It doesn't make them any less human or any less valuable. Yeah, yeah. You Certainly. know, just recognizing that I think is a huge first step. Yeah. People think their job is more important than other people's jobs. You think doctor is more important than a janitorial staff? One can't work without the other. Exactly right. But you have to step out of your ego here and recognize that. And people don't. And so it's the whole society operates within this ego of what we project of what is important. How much of a doctor is important versus a nurse or nurse versus technician versus janitorial stuff. Whatever the, the level we have on things. And, and people are judged on that. You know, the conversations of, so what do you do? Like that conversation. What if I just said, what if, you, what if I asked you, what do you do? And your simple answer would be like, I make a difference in someone's life. And then continue the conversation like nothing happened. I'm going to try that. Yeah. I'm going to try that. Let's see that. See what what happens with that. That is interesting. Yeah. So I always think about rather than saying what you do is what the end result of that you do is supposed to be doing. Like it's the intention of it. I'm in higher education, the lower tier of higher education. But my intention of every single day is I interact with students who are always in some sort of a critical need of something, their version of critical need. If I help them out that day, I made a difference in their life. So what if somebody asked me, 
what do you do each day? And my simple answer was like, I make a difference in people's lives. And that is the end of it. Now we can get to a point where I'm actually telling you what I work for and what my day looks like and all that. But those are just the intricacies of that big mission. Yeah. So. Well, it reminds me of the story of like the 1960s. We were yeah. working on the space program, trying to beat the Soviets to the moon. Yeah. And someone was doing a news report and they were at the NASA facility. Yeah. And someone asked the janitor, well, what's your job here? He said, I'm helping to send someone to the moon. Right, exactly. That's, that's the mentality you have that's, to have, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where connections are also happening because we're so, so disconnected, even in, in organizations. If you, if you look at how you know organizations are structured, yes, that janitorial staff is sending somebody to the moon. And if they know that, they're going to be making sure that place is potless. They, they, they have the to know time. it, but everyone else up the chain has to know it yeah. and reflect that. Yeah. Elvier, I just want to thank you for giving me so much of your time. I learned a ton about you today, and it's opened my eyes to a lot of new perspectives, particularly when it comes to remembering that everyone has their own story, and every story is worth telling. You don't have to be a celebrity to have an interesting story. And I think as people, all of us would be better off if we took more of an interest in the people around us in our community, learning their stories, and learning how we connect because truly that is, at the end of the day, that's the root of community, is being able to connect on a deeper level, share those personal things, have people that you can talk to and not feel like what you have to say is not important or might put you at risk of being ostracized or looked down on or have someone change their perspective. Because if you know someone at a true level, you can have a different opinion from someone, but still love and respect them as a human being. And that's the mission that I'm on. Thanks for sharing your story and how that all fits into the fold. Well, I appreciate you hearing it. I think you hit the nail on the head with that one. If you can create a space where these stories can be shared without any judgment, without any preconceived notions, I think that's where you start creating deeper connections. <laughs>